Jay Bogner has spent most of his adult life crisscrossing the globe, embarking on some of the most amazing bow hunting adventures anyone has ever attempted. Along the way, Gary has built the reputation of a conscientious bow hunter and conservationist, and has earned the title of the International Ambassador of Bow Hunting. The thing I always found bow hunting, always, was I had to work so much harder to get closer to the animal, to get inside his world, his circle, without being detected to ever get the shot. So I found I had to learn a lot more about him and a lot more about his habitat, his habits, and the, and the terrain and everything. Gary has been blessed with numerous tremendous trophies, and heading into a new century, he sat poised to join an elite group of bow hunters as one of a select few to take all 28 species of North American big game with his bow. As we start out on this next adventure, I've got three animals to go. The Alaska caribou, the mountain caribou, and the coos deer. Now join Gary as he attempts to conclude an amazing feat and complete the North American super sling. Alaska, land of mystery, intrigue, and timeless beauty. A place that captures the imagination and a place where dreams can come true. Gary has been lured to Alaska's nearly endless frontier time and again. This time, it was the call of the barren ground caribou that drew his attention, a calling he could not resist. I was very, uh, very excited to begin yep. uh, this adventure um, because uh, the outfitter was looking forward to taking a bow hunter and he had taken bow hunters for brown bear, caribou, and moose many times. I've been a registered guide for 14 years and, and I've been a master guide since 1997. The, the Alaska barren ground caribou is the largest of the caribou species, uh, and the Alaskan ones have the largest antlers uh, for Boone and Crockett scoring purposes. Their Latin name is Rangifer tyrandus, and, and they live up to that name. They're always traveling, and of course the tundra country is where they make their home. We just arrived at Wayne Woods' camp in the Taylor Mountains of Alaska. It was a two-hour flight from Anchorage out to here. They've had uh, rain for the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's a nice little break right now. The temperature's probably in the mid-50s, so it's really beautiful hunting weather and the caribou have started to move into this area. For the last week they've been seeing caribou uh, silhouetted on these hills all around us. And you can see the various trails. Um, caribou are just extremely nomadic and uh, could be here today, gone tomorrow, and back again the next day. Uh, they just move and they tend to move into the wind. Uh, so as the wind changes, they will change their uh, migration course. The, the Mulchatna Western Alaska herds is rapidly expanding in numbers and uh, they're current, currently estimated to be a little over 200,000 animals. Well, the first day as I remember, it had been raining and there was a lot of water puddles around and the stream was high. And so they took me on a four-wheeler across the river and up the river and th around through some mud holes and stuff. And a little bit 
up the mountain as far as they could and dropped us off. And then we started hiking. Yeah, the breeze is pretty much uh, coming out of the north. I guess what we'll do is work over to this point over here. That slopes off pretty good to the uh, east. And they should be filtering up out of the brush into the breeze. And there's nice open mark leads, good caribou trails come up right there. And we hiked all day long the first day and saw very, very few caribou. After, I think, two days, we had a little bit of weather and they decided that we should move to a spike camp. What he, yeah, this is the basic gear we need for a quick fly camp. Uh, we've got a Arctic oven tent, a camp box with all our cooking utensils and basic essentials to survive uh, out in the wilderness for a length of time, a water bucket with some paper products and sleeping pads and my personal gear. I recommend uh, what, what I'm wearing right now is what I find to work out very well for this country. is something with uh, uh, rubber bottoms and a leather upper. Uh, it works out very well. You can handle dry conditions to quite damp conditions. Just the best rain gear that uh, you can find. That's, it's just like optics. The more you spend on it, it seems like the, the better quality you're going to get. And, and uh, this is, you can get in the situation where it's going to save your life. I was very, uh, very excited. A good friend of mine was going to be the uh, bush pilot, Carl Brent. Well, the bush pilot in the last game where it takes quite a bit of just plain old experience being out there and in learning what the ground looks like, learning what the water surfaces look like, learning what you can and can't land on safely. And um, it just a lot of trial and error. Here in Alaska with aircraft incidences and fatality incidences, we do have the highest percentage of all the states. Um, I believe all of North America, including Canada. And unfortunately, most of the time, it's inexperienced pilots pushing the weather. In Alaska, the day you fly, you can't hunt. And we, when we arrived, coming into the spike camp, we saw caribou everywhere. Gary was thrilled. His dream seemed to be coming true. The migration was moving right through camp. He was excited. But he knew he had to wait. You could see where they were taking trails down through the valley and going back up over the to the next knoll. And I think they do that some of the reason because the wind blows and keeps the flies off them. But it excites you when you see them all. And you, it made that first night a long night waiting to get up in the morning and get at it. Would you believe after what I just told you when I got up in the morning, there wasn't a boo in sight anywhere? I took those 10 power Zeises, climbed up on the ridge where we landed, and I looked 360 degrees, and I couldn't see a caribou anywhere. It... The caribou had vanished. The migration had apparently evaporated overnight. 
but Wayne knew better, and he knew where to look. But that would also mean heading out across the tundra. Wayne was right about finding the herd, but he didn't find any bulls, at least not yet. We thought, boy, this is going to be a long hike every day just to get to where the caribou are appearing, and maybe we're going to have to move camp. Carl came in to see us and bring in some fresh bread and some supplies, and him and Wayne went for a ride. And I believe they flew something like 25 miles looking for caribou and came back. And I could see the minute they landed, the expression on their face, there wasn't any caribou. Like all of a sudden they had dried up, evaporated. Um, that was the last thing in the evening, which was good because again, we would not have been able to hunt with Wayne being the guy going up and taking a look. But we now knew that there was no point in pulling up camp because there wasn't any place else to go. That we might as well just stay there and try to hunt the few that we were seeing and hope that some others appeared from somewhere. The next day was also very slow until Gary and Wayne spotted movement on the ridge. A group with a couple respectable bulls in it stalled out um, for quite some time and we weren't sure whether we could we could get after them that the, the decision was made to make an attempt after them because they seemed to be really slowing down and we would have a lot better chance as twilight was approaching of, of being being on them mm -hmm. Wayne knew time was tight. The caribou wouldn't stick around. It was time to move. The pair made their way toward the ridge, hoping they could work in on the two excellent bulls, bulls that seemed to appear from nowhere. We had to cross this alder lead that we were following. I noticed a caribou trail bleeding off to the left that I thought was going to take us right where we wanted to go. And unfortunately, after about 15 feet through the alders, why our caribou trail disappeared, and we got into some foliage that was just just interlocked, and then you know we were having trouble negotiating it, and there was absolutely no way to move through it silently. Disappointed, Gary stood on the mountaintop when suddenly the herd of caribou turned and did something totally unexpected, heading straight back for Gary. They were right there, they were skyline, perfectly. And I just all ranged, and I thought I had the perfect shot, and it just didn't work out. And it was, uh, it was really a heartbreaker. Next day was, uh, was a bit windy. 
and we glassed. And you glass to your, you know, your eyeballs starting to get bloodshot looking through through those binoculars. And with the wind, you know, I was disappointed even if we saw a caribou, if the thing wasn't on top of us, I was beginning to think you you just wouldn't even be able to get a shot. Wayne just never gave up. We we go up and down this ridge our tent was on we'd go back to camp fix some tea whatever have a snack and he'd get right back out there and he'd be glassing i decided to go up above the other side of the knob where we'd been landing and take one last look at the mountainside to see if any caribou were coming through on the opposite mountain and it was getting quite late in the evening and we hadn't seen any activity at all on that mountain all day and Gary had just been over there not 20 minutes earlier not a caribou in sight but being forever the optimist as all hunters are I decided to make one last turn around our hill and I just barely crested the rise and I could see on the opposite mountain a good number of caribou coming right down a spine that looked like he might put them in position to cross below our camp. So I turned around and ran as hard as I could back to camp and told Jerry to get his bow. It looked like we might get one more stock in before the evening was over. We had to know whether they were gonna go left or right. So when we finally broke, we went halfway down the knob and got behind brush, and now you're waiting for to say, which way are they gonna go? We looked and caught the top of the antler and the caribou are going the high trail. They must have started down the other trail, did a 180 and gone back the other way. And we got there just in the nick of the time to the last point of cover. And the bull that Gary wanted was in the lead. The bull presented an opportunity. He hung up just a little bit instead of going straight up the hill. And I gathered enough wind to pull and make the release. Gary's 84-pound Hoyt Striker had delivered an Easton Double X 78-24-13 with an NAP three-blade shockwave 100-grain broadhead, but Gary's hike had taken its toll. That was the culmination of several days of, of unsuccessful stalks and not seeing a lot of animals, and oh, it was, it was just wonderful. It, the animal went maybe 40 yards and went down. This is one of those situations we had the we had the range on the bull and i was trying to get into position by the time i got drawn he may have saw me drawn and he started turning a quartering away and i he took more paces than i thought he did and i put the pin on that I thought, I remember hearing the range for. And it was just about 10 yards, the 10 yard wrong pin. I should have been on the next pin. And as it is, as you can see from that arrow, it's, it struck low and struck the leg and cut the femur artery. And he's bled out very, very quickly. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and enjoyed. I've got a great bull, 
But it's one of those things, whether I guess it's your gun hunting or bow hunting, that's going to that's gonna happen to everybody. So I should have readjusted. Again, I, I got caught up in the excitement of the moment. But what a moment. I can tell you, what a moment. This is great bear ground caribou one, and I can tell you, I worked for it. Well, that night, we went to bed happy campers. Let me tell you, I slept well that night. Um, the next morning, um, it was b barely daylight, I think, and uh, started to climb out of the sleeping bag and get out of the tent, and uh, Wayne was already gone. Uh, should have known, he, he's up before daylight and he's out there on a ridge glassing. He came running back in the camp and said, Quick, get your get your gear. Let's go. There's a there's a group of caribou with a good bull in it. I think maybe we can get a stock on them. Now understand, in Alaska, a non-resident can harvest two bull caribou, and there's nothing greedy about this because the the herd is exploding at such rates that the uh, habitat is actually becoming endangered. And so I grabbed the bow, Ryan grabbed his camera, and away we were off running. Got it wide open. Whatever we do, this last group this morning went right up here. So we can try this center patch here. Okay. Or we can take a gamble and that they'll do what 90% of the caribou have done and make this corner. What do you think we're getting? I think we should take a camel and get to this first alder batch if possible. Piece the way. We made it to some low, some low cover, not quite where we wanted to be, and. Here, once and again, uh, the lead cow caribou decided to come right our way, and we were really exposed, except for this real low cover we had to take refuge in. You have to just hope they disperse out enough. The terrain left Gary and Wayne nearly exposed, so the pair crawled slowly, hoping not to spook the herd. But one caribou had her eyes open and her nose in the wind. When that nosy cow spotted us, she turned the whole herd or group and made a 180, and the big clump we were in she decided to go around it the other way. So we had to race around the clump without being seen or heard. We made it to the end and we got the opportunity. 
And when I say the opportunity, the bull gave us the opportunity for a good shot. Nice. And the shot was true. Beautiful shot. This time, the 84-pound Hoyt striker with an Easton Double X 78 24 13 and an NAP three-blade shockwave 100 grain broadhead was true and right on the mark. Gary stood up and made a beautiful shot on him. The caribou went no more than, I would say, 50 yards, turned around and went down. It was, it was a, a great hunt. This morning, the way the wind was here, right at this time, it just didn't allow for us to get a yard closer, not a yard closer. And, uh, but he presented it absolute perfect shot broadside the way he was and I decided to take that shot and it was on his mark So in the matter of one 24-hour period, I had two Alaska bear and ground caribou. And it only took 45 years to accomplish this. Well, going into this year, yeah. I knew I had three animals um, and, to go and, to complete the North America Super Slam. And I could feel it that there was, there was pressure building on, on myself um, that I wanted, to, I wanted to accomplish this and complete this this year, that it really, and I had gotten with getting this animal I knew now I was within two animals of completing, but I knew also the two animals I had to go um, were very, very difficult animals. I didn't know it in the beginning, but after a number of unsuccessful adventures, I knew there was no assurance that I was gonna finish this year. I had selected the very best place in the world, I felt, for the mountain caribou. And that's in the Northwest Territories. And that's Carol and Dave Dutchick run a great operation and they have no trouble taking uh, three or four Boone and Crockett's. I had to focus on this hunt and give it my all and we'd be successful. Hey, this, this particular mountain caribou hunt with Dave and Carol Dudgick uh, is in the Northwest Territories. You fly up to Norman Wells, and then you take a charter flight into their base camp, and it's with horses. And it's not backpacking. And at my age, that's music to my ears. <laughs> I can still backpack, but it takes a lot out of me and I'd much rather be riding a horse <laughs> and so I knew we were going to get to use horses on this hunt 
and we would have great food and a great base camp and a great outfitter. Well, that first day, we rode a bit, but not bad. We only saw, though, a few caribou. And we sat on a mountain and glassed a river bottom where these caribou would come up through the river bottom or creek bottom to mineral licks, natural mineral licks. I got to say, I thought, oh, no. We're talking about a place, a wintering ground for caribou. There's somewhere between three and 4,000 caribou in Dave's area. And there wasn't any caribou, just a few stragglers. The next day, and the day after, and the day after, we learned to ride further and further and further. And we glassed more and more. We began to see a few caribou, but just very low, low numbers. And none that we could get within any reasonable range of. Dave, you could tell, was absolutely on the point of pulling his hair out of his head. He just couldn't understand it, and he was sending us further and further out each day in search because he just couldn't believe where were these caribou. Because just two weeks earlier, Fish and Game had reported there was at least 2,000 caribou in the general area of the base camp, and they had vaporized. With caribou sightings at a premium so far, and with other hunters having success in a different direction, Gary too decides to saddle up and head toward the flats. Once Gary arrived in the flats, it didn't take long for him to zero in on a tremendous bull. Come here. Come here. Here it is. There it is. They were bedded down out there about 125 yards away, and there was a nice bull in the group. Gary could see the bull was excellent, but he was bedded downwind, and there was almost nowhere to hide. Gary's stalk, which began quickly, soon became a slow crawl for cover. There's two bulls, yes. The biggest one. Yes. That other one's quite a bit smaller. That one poked me on for sure. I guess I'm going to do nothing more than spook him. 
is when you get that, you will probably be about 60 yards from where you're at. If I can wait for the wind to die. I finally decided after waiting and waiting that the best thing was for me on my hands and knees to try to crawl forward and see if I could get within shooting. First thing you know, the caribou had their noses in the air. They couldn't see me, but they knew we were there. Just make, we'll see. Let's just see what they do. If I thought I could go fast enough, see, I'd go to those bushes and see if I could get a shot. After all the hunts I've been on, I'm still not smart enough to so that I think I'm going to run fast enough to cut them off. And it ain't, you know. So as they start to string out, just like elk do in a string, I took off thinking I could cut off and get myself within range. Well, I got to just about range, but I think that caribou knew what the range was and he wasn't going to let me get one step closer and he kept going and his tail was waving. So I was close, but not close. And it made a long ride back to camp that night. I had one more day to go, and it wasn't looking very good. Last day proved to be fun. Any bow hunter would have been ecstatic. We saw a few caribou. We got some stalks. We rode horses fast. We rode them slow, but we never quite. We even climbed the mountain like we did in Alaska to the lungs trying to catch up with some that were moving up ahead of us, but we didn't get within bow range. And when we got into, into camp that night, we found that all the rifle hunters, but one had a magnificent great caribou. And the one guy who hadn't shot one had been there many times before and was looking for something absolutely spectacular. And he had had an opportunity, but chose not to take one. Dave and Carol were very disappointed for me. They wanted to see me succeed. They offered for me to come back again. They even offered if we wanted to try and stay. But we would not be able to hunt on horses. From this base camp, it takes them eight days to trail out their string of horses. And when they get out, they reach the McKenzie River where there's a ferry, and they have to ferry these horses across the McKenzie River. And they've got to be there on time because the ferry stops operating. And so they had, they had a long trail to ride, and it's, and it's all work. This is the end of the season, everybody's tired, and we really felt, after talking about it, that it just didn't make sense to stay any longer, get the camp closed up. Winter can be upon you overnight in that country and get the horses on their way out. But it still was a great adventure. And I appreciate everything that Carol and Dave did to help us succeed and give us a great time. Gary was deeply disappointed. His dream to conclude the North American Grand Slam seemed to be slipping away. But Gary has made many lifelong friends during his years as a bow hunter. But none would prove more important than Dave Coleman of McMillan River Outfitters in Canada's Yukon Territory. Because Dave just happened to have one more opening, which meant Gary had one more chance for the elusive mountain caribou. But he'd have to leave immediately.
arriving in Whitehorse, Dave's wife met me, picked me up right off the, the airline, took me around the airport over to where the charter service was to get me on an airplane to get me out into the camp. As I headed up to the Yukon on this particular trip, they had had exceptional warm weather for October. They were having trouble getting their moose, getting their caribou, just because the weather had been so warm, the rut and the animals had stayed in the dark timber and stuff. But Dave said a weather change was coming. And Dave, being an experienced guide and pilot, knew what he was talking about. The new morning revealed a fresh, heavy blanket of snow and a fresh chance for Gary to harvest a mountain caribou. The mountain caribou uh, populations are uh, mostly in the Yukon, uh, northern BC, and the uh, western side of the Northwest Territories. And uh, there's a very few in, on the eastern part of Alaska. Now, I knew there wouldn't be numbers like there would be in the Northwest Territory, because this is Yukon, and mountain caribou don't run around in big herds like the other caribou do. They're, they're much more sprinkled around in little groups. Well, we're good clear across the valley floor. And we spotted some caribou up here. They were just in the altars. We rode all the way across, and uh, we got up to this point, and the wind did a 180 degree change. It was in our face all the way, and that's what mountain hunting can be like. It reversed itself, came right up the draw, carried our scent right up to those willows, and when we reached these rocks, the caribou were going over the top, right up there in that little pass. So, another one, for the caribou and none for the hunters. We hunted out of base camp for a few days and finally made a decision that we had to get away from base camp to locate some bulls. It was going to take an eight to 10 hour ride to get there. So we saddled our horses, had our pack horses and enough supplies for a few days and we headed out. The weather was tough. We've had temperatures down to, to zero Fahrenheit, and uh, we probably had two feet of snow, which made it real difficult on the horses for getting around. On the way over, though, we bumped into two herd of caribou, but we were right in the middle between the spike camp and base camp, and there was not enough time to try to do any kinds of stalks or anything, we made the decision we had to keep going. I was told that the grizzly bears had fixed the cabin real, real nice. They were not kidding when they said this grizzly had practically destroyed this cabin. But we fixed it up, we went to work, nailing plywood back on and, and trying to use a shovel and, and a broom and clean it up and make a place to sleep and eat. Um, I wasn't complaining. It wasn't the Hilton, but uh, it, it was better than a little tent out in the snow because we could warm it up. This is usually the procedure to walk the animals away from camp ways, limber them up and the rider up, beginning the day. We rode all the way, halfway back to the base camp, and there was no caribou on the mountain. Stopping for some mid-afternoon tea, Lowell and Gary also took time to reflect on their strategy. We were up on the, going up the side of the mountain <clears throat> with the horses, and I looked over and the, uh, the bull come up over the skyline. And uh, I could see his horns right up on the peak there. And fortunately, uh, 
the bulls saw the horses and assumed that they were cow caribou, and I hoped they were cow caribou. And he, not having a, uh, any cows with him, decided that, that he should come check us out. A lot of times when the bull caribou run up to the horses, they'll come within about 100 yards, but they won't come right up within bow range to a, to a, to a situation like that. So we had to uh, close the distance between them. dropped down into the gully out of our sight and we had to move a bit to get uh, to get closer to them. The 84-pound Hoyt Striker with an Easton Double X 78 2413 and an NAP three-blade shockwave 100 grain broadhead was true. The aero flight was perfect. He's going down now. I can't see him now. I think he's down. I think he's down. Let's get over there. This magnificent caribou was the last caribou I needed to complete taking all five caribou of North America. The guys that were with me they were so excited for me, the guide actually took off running across the snow behind the caribou, screaming with his arms up in the air, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. That was... We got one. Oh. Oh man. <laughs> beautiful bull. Four beautiful bull. trips. Four trips for a mountain caribou. And we're on the seventh day. Ten day. Of a ten day hunt. It has come together. Yet I was beginning to have my doubts. We've had snow and fog and snow and fog. One blue bird day. And Lowell never gave up. He just kept trudging along like a trooper and said, we keep, we keep with it, we keep with it. We're gonna do it. I almost couldn't believe it. Four hard, long adventures to get a mountain caribou. I had the barren ground caribou. I'd been on two mountain caribou hunts. It had finally taken my mountain caribou, so I was down to one animal. So a lot of pressure was off me but I knew I probably had the most difficult animal yet to go, and I needed a break. 
And this was a fun break. This was something like turning to, returning to my roots. Returning to the King Ranch isn't just another hunt. It's, uh, it's getting the opportunity for some camaraderie and fellowship that is second to none with Witch Thompson and the staff. Uh, my name is Butch Thompson. I'm the resource manager for King Ranch Incorporated. I'm in charge of uh, all range and wildlife resources and managing uh, the same. King Ranch is approximately 825,000 acres. Uh, we have about 60,000 acres in cultivation that's co cotton and milo, and the rest is in rangeland. My favorite time to go to the King Ranch is about the second week in December, because that's when the whitetail rut comes in. And what I find challenging and exciting is the opportunity to rattle and draw in bucks of all size that are either coming, looking for a fight, looking for an opportunity, or just curious. The King Ranch and its 800,000 acres is home to some of North America's most amazing wild whitetails. And yes, they are wild. This is a true ranch, not a farm. The only high fence on King Ranch is around our Clayburg County Airport to keep the deer out of the airport. Uh, we don't high fence anywhere else. A uh, number of years ago, King Ranch put up a high fence along one stretch of a little farm road on the south end of the ranch because of complaints from farmers that our deer were getting into their fields. Uh, so we did high fence about a three mile stretch of, of road at one time, but now things have changed over the years. The farmers don't complain about it. And, and now they've, uh, matter of fact, they pull the fence up so the deer can get under and get into their fields. And as we started this year, we saw wonderful deer. But we weren't seeing Mr. Big. So he said, let's go over and look at another pasture over here. We were coming down this two track when we spotted this great eight point. And it looked like a management buck. Well, we consider a management buck and here on King Ranch is a slick horned eight point deer that is four years old or older. Uh, we, we will sell those as management deer hunts. And uh, you know, it's not to say that an eight point deer that's four or five years old won't get, you know, won't get better. They can, and they can get non-typical in their later years. But for the most part, when they're four or five years old and they're slick horned eight point deer, they're not the kind of deer we want in our herd. We're trying to grow a little bit better deer than that. So we do uh, take those as management bucks. Butch felt that we could make a stock and get within range because he was so, just so encompassed in trying to keep all these smaller bucks away from this doe. It took some time, but we worked towards the clump of brush where the doe was bedded. And the buck kept making a big circle around, pushing the other bucks away. And he came within range. The shot was true. Gary's 72 pound Hoyt defined with an Easton ACC 360 and a 100 grain NAP three blade shock wave were perfect.
That's an old one. He's an old butt. Big old mature eight point butt. What we consider a management buck. He's past his prime, but he's a dominant buck here, running off some good young deer off that doe. Great buck to take for a management deer. Probably going to be about a 140. Really? Eight point. What, really? How, good, how old? Five, six years? Yeah, he's probably six years, maybe seven years old. He's an old buck. Oh man, that's good. Big, that's, heavy deer too. that's the kind of take, huh? Great shot. Good <laughs> shot, dude. Great shot. Oh man, look at that. Look at there. Beautiful. He is a pretty buck. Pretty, pretty buck. Oh man. man. Got you know, some good heavy. When you're from heavy Michigan, time. Butch, and you've been born and raised with these things, you know. Yeah. I've never seen a deer like this at home. I'm I'm pushing 60 years old. I've never seen a deer in the wild at home. Well, he's a great buck. He is. Uh, he's a good poping young deer and good heavy horns. Wow. Got, I like this bladed. Yes. Bladed main beam. Really nice. I was elated getting this deer. Butch Thompson's like an encyclopedia of knowledge, and I just soak it up like a dry sponge. The camaraderie second to none. Well, the next morning, to my pleasure, I found out that we were going to get to spend the day with the new wildlife biologist that was going to be responsible for all the wildlife. I'm Mick Hellickson. I'm the uh, ranch wildlife biologist for the King Ranch and uh, hired in January. And uh, deer and quail are our priority. And so I spend most of my time managing poor deer and quail. We're probably beyond quality deer management and more like trophy deer management or a trophy form of quality deer management. That's kind of how I like to phrase it. But, uh, under quality management, the goal is to pass up year and a half and two and a half year old bucks to try to maximize the harvest of three and a half and older age bucks. Whereas what we're trying to do here, our goals are to maximize the harvest of mature bucks, six and a half years old and older. Well, we started out that morning going to a few spots that uh, Mickey had seen some good bucks. We hadn't had an opportunity, hadn't seen a big trophy uh, deer yet. And uh, Mickey said, you know, some of the guys have told me there's a great buck staying over in this area. Let's, let's head over there and see if we can spot him. As we're arriving over in this area, Mickey was quick to spot this great buck. And he says, oh my word, he says, I think that buck right out there in daylight is the ghost buck. What do you mean the ghost buck? He says, well, the other guys, they, they only get fleeting glimpses of him. He's just, he's never given anybody the opportunity to get a shot. And that includes the gun hunters. Well, he did look great, but I didn't think we were gonna get the chance. I thought a deer like this is, you know, the minute we're out there on foot coming through the brush, he's going to evaporate. Well, this buck was working his way down along this two track. He did not have a doe with him, which was really a plus because if, if they're along, they're just, they're just going to, they're flighty and they're just going to go. But we started to do a stalk behind him. As he made a kind of a curve in the road, we were able to cross the curve, break off the two track, and cut him off and actually get ahead of him. Gary kept working his way closer, but why was the tremendous buck out in the open? Gary and Mick weren't sure, but they weren't going to second guess their luck either. When he came by the brush, as he's browsing along, he gave the opportunity. I 
Another perfect shot from the 72-pound Hoyt Defiant with an Eastern ACC 360 and a 100-grain NAP 3-blade shockwave. That was a very good shot there. Mm. Man, look at that rack sticking up there. Oh, I'm low. It's a heart shot. Look at that butt. Man. Look at that deer. Oh, what an animal. <laughs> look at that deer. What an animal. <laughs> Either, oh, six by five. Man, <laughs> look at that deer. Woo. What a beauty. What a beauty. Two, three abnormals. Mm. Big body deer, too. What kind of age? Let's look at him. Yep. No, nah, he's old. Oh. Eight and a half. Oh, that's the, this is the the deer I got last night was six and a half. That's the oldest deer I've ever harvested. And now the jump, I was just hoping to go to seven and a half before there maybe the you know <laughs> you know when you think forty five years of bow honey. Eight and a half year old deer, fully mature South Texas whitetail. The older he gets. And he goes through a hard and difficult rut. He takes his body weight and his energy down so far that he also becomes rather easy prey to the coyotes. Right. They'll zero in on a buck like this. And many of the older, older bucks like this that can that get to this age end up meeting uh, with, let's just say, a bad death. A bad death. Gary, 20, from telemetry studies that we've done in South Texas, 25 to 30 percent of the eight and a half year old bucks are going to die of natural causes before next year. So he had a one in four chance of not surviving to next year because of coyotes and other natural causes. That's it. That's really interesting, right? Man, what a deer. And it was neat then to have the biologist, you know, look at him and be able to give me some statistics about this magnificent creature. And that's the best, turned out to be the best, the most mature, the biggest set of horns that I've ever gotten in a white tail. Gary now stood on the threshold of joining the few bow hunters to ever take all 28 North American big game species his quest for the coos whitetail would begin on the Bellutal Ranch in northern Mexico. Well, this coos deer hunt was going to take place in Sonora, Mexico. I was going there because it was a very special ranch, very large, good conservation program in place, well managed, and Jimmy Ryan had been very successful there the year before. Jimmy's a, uh, a fellow bow hunting friend. I was yarring northern Sonora, Mexico, in the foothills. The elevation here is about uh, a little over 4,000 feet, 43, 4,400. You know, I think of Sonora as the desert, but there are mountains, some real mountains. These, these hills have got uh, lots of live oak in them. And you get down towards the bottom, you got mesquite, and it's ideal habitat for the coos deer. The coos deer is the smoothest of the whitetail family. It's only about 100 pounds, and a, a, a big male crocket is about I think one ten, and uh, for both young, uh, sixty-five is all this this glorious. So you can see that when compared to Alberta or Michigan white deer, that's pretty small. Half forty. Little bit is getting up here on these 
foothills and glassy over on the far side uh, side hills where the sun is going to be shining the warmth the animals get up and start to feed there's a nice little goose buck that just got up probably about 90 90 inches a couple of females with them So we decided we'd go all the way around and go up the back side of this. And if we come over the top and the wind was right, we should be in good shooting range. Mm -hmm. The landscape of Northern Mexico presented Gary with unique challenges in his pursuit. His decisions were critical. So he glassed the area one more time checked the wind and began to move in. Well, we climbed the hill as fast as we could and as quiet as we could, but if you've ever climbed on cinders and through thorns and cactus and got poked and pricked slipped and slide. There isn't anything very quiet about it, but we did our best. We got to the top and we came over. And par for the course, the deer saw me before I saw him. And all I got was a glimpse. Well, in the days to come at this ranch, it was proving to be very, very difficult. We were seeing animals, but there was just never any way to get close enough. Finally, we decided to go down and set at a little water hole or a dam where there was water. We waited some time, and some coos deer came down off the mountain, dropped into a dry creek bed. Beyond being known to us, there was a couple little pools down below, and they were able to get water without coming in. And the one that I saw coming, the wind did its trick on us, and he turned around and never came in close. On another day, we picked up the first thing in the morning, a couple of nice bucks hanging together, one bigger than the other. But they had themselves in a position where there just was no way to approach them. We were gonna have to let they make them make a move, either go to water, get up and start, start feeding or browsing in some direction where we might be able to do an intercept. We glassed those deer practically all day. When finally, out of frustration, I talked Ryan in to saying, let's give it a go. Let's try. We didn't go 30 yards down the hill when we looked and the deer were gone. The gray ghost again had vanished. This was the last encounter and I had struck out. This was hunt number three. And I, I was very, very disappointed. And I thought the best possible chance of getting a coos deer was at this place. I went home very down, very disappointed. Um, I felt like maybe this was going to take a year or two more, many more hunts to accomplish getting a coos deer. The final trophy of the Super Slam was proving elusive. Gary's Mexican adventure came up empty, so Gary moved north. And I had a friend, Jim Van Norman, who had been to Arizona and hunted with a fellow. 
Now, what Jim had accomplished has been done by very few. Jim Van Norman is a veteran Wyoming mule deer guide with numerous bow hunting trophies to his credit. But for this hunt, Jim left the security of his Wyoming ranch for the uncertainty of pursuing an Arizona coos deer. Fortunately for Jim, veteran guide Bill Bishop was at his side. He'd gone on this coos deer hunt and got a deer on the first day within an hour and a half of setting in a tree blind. And I found this incredible, almost unbelievable. I got on the phone to Bill. He said, yes, he's got an opening. Well, I had not met Bill, only had talked on the phone with him, and he sounded like a great guy. Gary wasted no time leaving for Arizona. First day, we decided we were going to go to the spot where Jim had arrowed his buck. This morning, it was, we were going to get in the ground blind here and hunt, and the wind's perfect for it. You can see the, the air's going straight up. We'd have been in an ideal situation right here, except for all the wolf and lion track coming down that trail. We're not seeing any deer track in here at all right now. The next couple of days, I could tell that Bill was beginning to get nervous, get frustrated, and wanted to pull his hair out just a bit. Bill's longtime friend and hunting partner, Les Egg, is another Arizona coos deer veteran, and he'd seen some promising sign nearby. Knowing Bill was frustrated, Les pitched in. Bill was having such a hard time finding any any scrapes, and we, I was too. We just couldn't find any movement. So, uh, for myself, because I'm hunting, and uh, I found uh, a place where I saw one scrape, and I, I stuck a stand up, uh, I, and I came back and told Bill, I, I think we have one finally. And, and uh, I'd seen the buck, and uh, I, I knew he was a good one. I thought, well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Jerry have this one, and Bill have this one. Well, Les proved to be a real new friend, for it was going to be his tree stand that I was going to get to use. I hadn't been in my stand for too awful long. Without any warning, this buck came up out of the thicket, and he passed less than 10 yards below Bill. But with a tree in the way, I couldn't get a shot. I finally had a coos deer buck right there. And if he's done it once, maybe he'll do it again. Gary would have to be patient. He'd have to continue to wait until the next day. Must have been an hour, hour and a half. And mystically, no noise, no nothing, all of a sudden, Mr. Buck, Mr. Coos Deer Buck, stepped almost in the same place where I'd seen him the day before. Now, I can tell you, I was wired. I was trembling, and I said, this is your chance. This is, the, this is gonna be the first time I've had an opportunity for a shot. I had a little flag out there for distance, and wouldn't you know, He's in between the flags. So I'm trying to say to myself now, hold the one pin high, hold the other one low, hold it. Which one now hold high, which one hold low? And I'm trying to say, calm down, calm down, you know. And finally, I just put the pin higher and he, and he was quartering just right and I released. the deer went down just like that. I thought, I got him, but something looks wrong. He, he's, he's down, 
Geary's 72-pound Hoyt Defiant with an Easton ACC 360 and a 100-grain NAP three-blade shockwave was true. The arrow was true, but I didn't know I'd misjudged. I was high. The buck, the next thing I know, gets up, and he starts to go. But because of the way the shooting lane was in the brush, there wasn't another opportunity. He goes over the hill, and I looked over at Bill, and Bill signaled like it's okay, just quiet, and we waited. We came down out of our tree stand, and we were really quiet, and we walked over there, and the arrow was there. And we could see where the buck was having a difficult time going. He had gone over the side of the hill into the thick underbrush. Decided right there, we needed to back off. Bill and Les really were exceptional trackers. This, this was an interesting tracking job. It was one of the toughest tracking jobs I've ever, ever been on. I've been on some tough ones. This was a, a two, three man tracking job. One man just couldn't have done this because of the way that the buck moved through such rugged country and we had to fan on every little trail that broke off. Uh, it made it really difficult and, and uh, Bill's ability and uh, then mine's pretty good too. I'm not dragging, but you know, we work hard at this. This isn't something that just happens. And uh, this challenged us, seriously challenged us. I, I had my doubts and I kept my positive attitude, but uh, uh, <laughs> I was worried. Gary, Les, and Bill kept on the trail that afternoon and into the next day. Would Gary complete his quest? No one knew. We looked over the edge and you could see where the deer had fallen right off the side of the hill. And we started down the hill and we're pointing, look, and he fell there, he fell there, he fell there. And I looked and I said, and there's an deer. And the guys were all looking out there like that. Where, where, you know? I said, no, laying right down there in the brush pile. There's the deer. And finally everybody saw it all at once. And it was like, oh my word. There he is. And this ends a 45 year, going on 46 year quest of North America. Starting out with a little long bow when I was 12 years old, then a recurve and my first white tail, which was a doe when I was in my early 20s. The gray ghost is deserving of everything they say about him. He's the hardest whitetail species, the hardest deer species to hunt there is. And Bill and his gangs have done an outstanding job here, and I'm, I'm so pleased. This is my fourth coos deer hunt, and the first time I've ever taken a shot. And they brought this quest to an end, and I just thank Bill and Bill Jr. and Les and the whole camp for all their efforts. I had my coach deer. Four trips, first opportunity ever for a shot at the Great Ghost, and I had a beautiful little three by four Great Ghost. And it was the end of a long, long quest. I had now taken the 20 eighth North America species.
I feel very, very fortunate to have been able to go on all these adventures and harvest all these animals. I feel honored to be among those who have also accomplished this feat. There's something that's very, very important to me, and that's the right to hunt. That's about preserving the wildlife we have. We have to do something about preserving them. And the organization that's in the forefront about doing something is Safari Club International. Safari Club isn't just interested about hunting African animals. They're about animals all around the world, especially right here in North America. For the founders of Safari Club, we're North America hunters. If you care about our future, the future of hunting, if you care about the future of wildlife, the conservation of wildlife, then I encourage you to join Safari Club International.